Okay. Good morning. Um, welcome to the first short talk in this uh, session number six, focused on technology. Um, as you heard earlier in the session from Ronan O'Malley, the JGI does a lot of in-house technology development, but we also partner with external groups for the development of more specialized technologies. And so this next presentation will provide a fantastic example of this type of collaboration under our so-called ETOP program. In this particular project, um, the JGI worked with researchers at Lawrence Livermore National Lab to develop methods for scalable um, isotope probing for metagenome studies, so-called SIP-omics. The presentation will be given by Erin Lucio, who is a staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore. And her research focuses on how roots and mycorrhizae affect key microbial processes in soil, such as decomposition of plant residues and turnover of soil organic matter. Erin has been heavily involved in the development of these new pipelines in collaboration with JGI. And she will talk about that in detail, but she will also um, give us a few examples of the types of insights that can be gained through the application of these methods. Now, before I turn it over to Erin, just a brief reminder, um, anytime during the talk, please put questions into the Q&A and then uh, we will hopefully have some time for those at the end. Erin. Awesome, great. Thanks, Cecil. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about uh, some of the methods we've developed and the science that has come out of it. Uh, so a key issue in microbiology is that we often don't know what microbes are doing. Uh, we don't know what they're eating. Um, we don't know their genomes. And so uh, a key goal in microbial ecology is to link the identity of these microbes with you know, what they eat, what they uptake. And this has been a, a holy grail uh, for science discovery um, over the past two decades. So there are a number of ways to do this um, that uh, use isotopic tracers as a way to link identity and function. And so isotopes are, are elements and they're rare versions of these elements that are either lighter or heavier um, and they can be imaged, um, they have, they're denser, they can be separated and sequenced. And so I've, I've put up a, a few examples of, of some of these different isotope techniques but the one I'm going to talk to you about today is, is density gradient SIP. And so uh, this is a process where we take, oops, all right, where we use heavier isotopes um, such as 13C, 15N, 18O. And we use substrates that are, are labeled with these isotopes. And then in this case, I'm going to use the example of a 13C rhizosphere um, where those isotopes are incorporated into active organisms, not dormant or dead organisms, and then are enriched into the backbone of, of the DNA. So right here. And then we can stick it in a tube and spin it really fast, and this DNA will sort based on how dense it is. So we have the light DNA and the heavy DNA that's taken up that 13C. And then we can fractionate it. So here I'm showing you DNA on one axis and density on the other. And here's our unlabeled control. Um, and what you can see is that in these organisms that took up in the rhizosphere that ate this 13C um, have become labeled. So there's this area of partially labeled organisms. And then these organisms who actually took it up a lot of label that are highly en enriched. And so these are, are great for um, creating a high quality SIP metagenome amplified genomes or MAGs. Um, from these complex environments. But one issue is that this is a very laborious protocol that has a lot of hands-on time. And so this was the focus of our ETOP project, um, which was to develop a, a semi-automated approach to make this more high throughput and more accessible um, to the scientific user community. So I'm gonna mostly talk about um, these first three steps so um, one is pre-screening the DNA to make sure that there's enough isotope in there to actually successfully do density gradient SIP. And then also um, the collection and cleanup steps. So automating fractionation and, and the desalting of, of all these different fractions. A key consideration for SIP experiments is how much 
isotope is actually in your DNA. So I showed you that density gradient. That was a really best case scenario where the 13C DNA is you know, all the way down in its own little bubble, but it's normally a big smear. Um, and so what this graph is showing you from um, a recent paper that we published is that the, the number of replicates you need really depends on how enriched your DNA is. So this is statistical power. So if you have super enriched DNA, here we have, this example is 10 atom percent um, XS18O, um, you can get away with three replicates and, and have great separation. But if you're down at the bottom here at two atom percent excess, maybe even at six replicates, it's not going to really work. So screening this is, is a key um, um, point to, to make sure that these are successful. So what we developed is a, a process that uses the nanosims. So this is a secondary ion mass spectrometer um, that can um, do mass spectrometry on surfaces. So we spot our DNA on here and the nanosim blasts it with a beam and it goes up to the mass spec. And then we can quantify how much 15N, uh, 13C or 18O is in that DNA. And so I'm showing you is that this is um, very highly quantitative and that we can use it to detect um, low atom enrichment and 25 nanograms of, of DNA. And so uh, the JGI has also been using MALDI as a way um, uh, to pre-screen DNA to make sure that there's enough um, isotope for um, success. And so um, the second part of this process is automating um, the actual fractionation. So here we have our, our SIP guru technician, Marissa Loeffler, who, you know, originally it's, you're actually taking this tube and, and dripping it into these tubes and it's super tedious and it kind of makes you want to cry. So we, <laughs> we turned this, um, used a uh, Agilent Infinity fractioning collector to essentially hook this tube up to this fraction collector and then um, put it, drop, automatically drop those fractions into a 96 hole plate. And using this, we can put, we typically put four samples in a plate. So then moving downstream, we're, we're in a high throughput format and we can process multiple samples at the same time. And this process is very uh, comparable to, to manual fractionation. And then once it's in that plate, um, we move into a uh, Hamilton star robot to do desalting. Um, we found that peg precipitations work better than mag beads in our hands for getting better yields. And then also recently, um, uh, Rex uh, had um, a, an insight that adding a small amount of um, surfactant, so in our case, tween, might actually help increase yield. So the surfactant is, is helping the DNA from not sticking to the tube. Um, and so when we add a tiny bit of tween, we actually are almost doubling our yield. So this is a, a experiment that we ran. So this is about mm, 30 to 60 replicates for each of these bars. So it seems uh, pretty recent reproducible that this is helping. And then a uh, final consideration here is how many fractions do you want to sequence? Uh, this is also from uh, Ella's paper, and she has an Illumina webinar on this if you want to hear more about it. Um, but the take home from this is that she found in a, a five mil tube, about nine fractions um, was pretty good for um, being able to detect um, these separations. So on one axis, we have the true positives and true negatives and then the fraction size. And so what you can see is that for most atom percent enrichments, um, nine or more fractions, it keeps you in the true positive or true negative realm. But when um, at lower atom percent enrichments, this really drops off. So if you go down to like say three fractions, um, you're gonna have a really hard time. So this is, is a good sweet spot for you know, how many samples to actually sequence. So in summary, um, this process is about three times faster than manual and really greatly reduces the hands-on time, which is awesome. Um, we're currently limited to 16 samples because that's what our ultra centrifuge rotor can hold. Um, and here's just some information on the number of samples we processed and, and the reagents and um, how much it costs per sample in, in reagents. And so finally, just to end, I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, studies where being able to sequence large experiments has really helped in um, understanding what's going on. So in this first experiment, 
This is a, a switchgrass experiment where we looked at drought in a marginal soil. And so um, we have, uh, this is just looking at one time point out of three, um, but we essentially have six treatments. So we have a, a water plea and a water limited, and then we have three different types of fungal treatments. So no fungi, and then two of these different types of mycorrhizal fungi. And so what you can see is on this y-axis, this uh, atom percent incorporation of 18O is a, a metric for how active these microbes were. So in when there was a lot of water, um, in the hyphosphere, there was a lot of activity. But once we took away the water, that activity really went down. But when we add in these mycorrhizal fungi, they essentially rescued activity. And so the um, activity in the drought and well water was comparable to, um, to the um, replete control. And in a second experiment, this is a, a large oscillating redox experiment, which looked at um, how does oscillating redox affect litter decomposition. And in this experiment, um, we have multiple time points and four redox treatments. And so here we have um, anoxic treatment with static um, anaerobic, um, static aerobic, and then fluctuating. And one of the things that was striking that when we were just initially looking at the data is that, um, so what you're looking at here is this is atom percent enrichment and this is abundance, is that these rare organisms are not, not necessarily rare, but the less abundant organisms tended to be the most active. So some of our most abundant organisms uh, really weren't taking up that much isotope, that more this high level of enrichment was happening in some of these less abundant organisms. Uh, which is nice because that's what SIP essentially is, is targeting, is, is letting you hone in on these uh, less abundant members of the community that may be doing something really important functionally. Um, and this also allowed us to identify um, strict anaerobic organisms that uh, bacteria that are, are doing decomposing litter under these anaerobic conditions. And so with that, um, thanks for listening. Um, and I just want to plug that, you know, SIP capabilities are now uh, available as part of the JGI CSP annual car, as a, which is a great, um, we, we're happy that all this work has been able to make it to JGI and brought to the user scale level. Thanks. Oh, I think Axel, are you muted? I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for telling me. So yeah, okay. thanks, Aaron. that was a great talk. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or in the Q&A yet, unless I'm doing something wrong. Um, so if you have any, please put them in there. If, so while we're waiting, so I, I have a question that I I always ask when, when the JGI based component of this gets presented, which is so um, related to, you know, assembly of microbial genomes um, from this, like when you have the fractionated um, uh, collective uh, metagenomes. Um, Obviously, you can start to use uh, like MAG approaches to identify new species. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? And um, also something that I always ask is like, what is the right strategy for, for doing this? Um, would you assemble across all the fractions that you get or would you assemble them individually? Do you have any yeah. thoughts on this? No, that, that's a good question. Um, so uh, what's really cool about SIP is that you've taken a community and you've split it into all of these different fractions. So, you know, what's in a bulk sample, you're going to maybe have, you know, one set of abundant organisms, but over a set of 10 fractions, each fraction is going to have a different set of abundant organisms. Um, so what we found is that when we uh, co-assemble across an entire gradient um, is that we're actually able to, to produce more mags um, than we would if we had just tried to assemble from, from the bulk soil alone. Um, so it's, it's kind of a nifty thing 
even with not even considering, you know, the fact that, you know, things are enriched and you're identifying targeted organisms is that it's just a, a different way to, to spread out the sequencing of a, of a community. Okay, great. And here is another question. Will JGI do the pre-screening with nanosims as well as processing? Just curious, as most people do not have access to nanosims. Yeah, so I mentioned is that um, uh, JGI is using a, a MALDI approach in, in Trent Northern's lab um, to do this pre-screening. So that is part of that process, um, so to make sure that, because it's a huge investment you know, to go through this, um, so to make sure that that would be a, a successful sample for for SIP sequencing. And another question, what kind of 13C compounds were used? How do you know if the organisms incorporating 13C are actually doing something? Yeah, so in the um, examples I showed you, um, one was 13C was provided to the atmosphere of the plant. So they're fixing it and then they're producing their own exudates. Um, and then in the second experiment with the redox experiment, the, the plant material was labeled in advance with 13C. Um, and so as a part of eating it, microbes are, are turning over their DNA and they, they build it into their biomass. So this is really only works for assimilatory processes. So if you're, um, you know, just, if you're gaining energy um, autotrophically by, you know, um, ammonia oxidation, like you're not going to be taking up that ammonia. You're not going to see the nitrogen signal uh, necessarily. Um, wow, I hope I just didn't blow ammonia oxidation there. Chris Francis here in this talk. <laughs> Why did I pick that as an example? But um, but so it only works for assimilative processes where you're um, actually incorporating that isotope. And then the timing is really important too, because as you know, microbes eat things, there's a uh, meta, there's cross feeding, uh, metabolic handoffs. Um, there's you know different trophic levels, so that that carbon can go through the food chain. Um, so yeah, it's it's. Um, but yeah, so the primary thing to think about is that it's it is for assimilative processes primarily. Okay, thank you.